Well, good morning, Clear Creek. We're so glad that you're here this morning. If you're visiting with us, man, we, we hope you'll just keep on coming. We'd love to have you as part of the church family. We don't want you to visit long. We want you to be a part of this, this church family at Clear Creek Church. Uh, this is a, 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 an interesting place to be. God's really moving amongst the people here. And so I want to encourage you, encourage our other people. Just continue to be prayerful for the work at Clear Creek and continue to be encouraging to one another. This morning's sermon is entitled, When the Tough Get Going. But before we start that... Let's bow in a word of prayer. God, you're an amazing God. We lift your name up this morning knowing that you're the only God that's living. You're the only God that's real, and you're the only God that loves his creation. Father, we come before you this morning realizing you have a plan for our lives. You have a plan for our church. And Father, as we look at what that might be and what our destiny might be, may we also be aware of the traps that lie in, in wait the things that will prevent us from reaching this destiny, the, the things that will prevent us from living as eternal people and, and living as a church that you'd have us to be. This morning, as we study these words, this story of Moses, Father, we pray that we'll look at these, these incidences and that they'll serve as a cautionary tale and that we can take these things and we can be strengthened by them and that we can realize that you have some amazing plans for us. Father, we thank you for Jesus. We know that without him, we're nothing. With him, we're all things. And we're not saved because we're good people. We're saved because you're a good God. And we lift you up because of that. And thank you for Jesus and the love that you've shown for us through him. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Let's move on to the next question. Go ahead. Hi, my name is Jenny. I'm a sophomore. And this is for all three of you. Can you say why America is the greatest country in the world? The New York Jets. <laughs> no, I'm going to hold you to an answer on that. What makes America the greatest country in the world? I'm not letting you go back to the airport without answering the question. Well, our Constitution is a masterpiece. James Madison was a genius. The Declaration of Independence is, for me, the single greatest piece of American writing. You don't look satisfied. I want a human moment from you. Why is America Not the greatest the country in the world. Professor, that's my answer. You're saying... Yes. You're you know, All right. And yeah, you, uh, sorority girl, just in case you accidentally wander into a voting booth one day, there's some things you should know. And one of them is there is absolutely no evidence to support the statement that we're the greatest country in the world. We're seventh in literacy, 27th in math, 22nd in science, 49th in life expectancy, 178th in infant mortality, third in median household income, number four in labor force, and number four in exports. We lead the world in only three categories. Number of incarcerated citizens per capita, number of adults who believe angels are real, and defense spending. Now, none of this is the fault of a 20-year-old college student, but you nonetheless are, without a doubt, a member of the worst period, generation period ever. Sure used to be. We stood up for what was right. We fought for moral reasons. We passed laws, struck down laws for moral reasons. We waged wars on poverty, not poor people. We sacrificed, we cared about our neighbors, we put our money where our mouths were, and we never beat our chest. We built great big things, made ungodly technological advances, explored the universe, cured diseases, and we cultivated the world's greatest artists and the world's greatest economy. We reached for the stars, acted like men, First step in solving any problem is recognizing there is one. For the record, I believe America is the greatest country on the planet, but I think sometimes it's because I'm an American. And I wonder how my judgment is clouded, and, and I start thinking about this clip I showed you from a show called The Newsroom, and I think the measure of true greatness is being able to look at things as they are and dream about how they can be. And that's why the advances in our country have happened. That's why you live in the freedom that you live in. It's because someone somewhere sat down and said, this is our reality, and this is how it can be. 
Last week, uh, Melissa and I were having lunch with another couple in the church, and, and we, as we do, we had conversations, and people seemed to like having church conversations with me, so I'm willing to do that. And they talked about a family that had visited with the Clear Creek Church, and they had decided that they were going to look at some other places. And, and I did my preacher thing. I said, well, you know what? I just, uh, what I really want for this family is I want them to find a place where they can serve God. And to which my wife looked me in the eye and said, you know you're lying through your teeth. And she's right. I think Clear Creek's the greatest church in the world. I, I can't imagine why anybody would not want to be a part of the church family at Clear Creek. I just, I, it, it is beyond me. I don't understand it, but some of that is because I'm so invested. Truth is, when I back away from our church and I look at who we are, I realize that we're a really, really good church. But are we a great church? No. But we can be. When I think about where we are as Clear Creek Church, I, I think about the story of Moses. And this morning, we're going to begin in Exodus 3, but don't put the slide up yet, Phil. Uh, what's happening here is that Moses is, is in the wilderness. He's killed the Egyptian. He's, he's there. He's really not sure what God's got planned for him. And God's about to speak to him. And what's going to happen is he's going to set into motion destiny, a journey toward destiny. And so as he speaks to Moses in the wilderness, he says these things in, in chapter 3, in verses 7 through 9, said, The Lord said, I, I've surely seen the affliction of my people who are in G Egypt and have given heed to their cry because of their taskmasters, and I'm aware of their suffering. So I've come down to deliver them from the power of the Egyptians and to bring them up from the land to a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey to a place of the Canaanites and the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. I always think he may have forgot the cellulites. <laughs> uh, now before the cry of the sons of Israel had come to me, furthermore, I have seen the oppression with which the Egyptians are oppressing them. And what God is saying is he's saying, okay, my people need more room. See, what's happened here is that there was a family that moved into Egypt, Joseph's family, this, this father with 12 sons and their, their wives and their small families. They lived on the outside, but now this family had grown to about 1.5 million people. And what God was asking Moses to do uh, in reality is take a city the size of Atlanta and move it to Birmingham on foot. But it was really more than that. It wasn't really about moving people. It wasn't really about transporting. What was happening was God was calling Moses to lead a journey. A journey out of slavery and into promise. A journey from oppression into destiny. And that's the journey that we at Clear Creek Church of Christ are on. We don't want to go back to the good old days. We're on the journey, and we're in the middle of this journey, and we have come out of slavery, and we're on our way to being a church of promise, a, a church that is landing into this place where God has envisioned the church to be, a, a place that truly connects people to God and one another, a, a place where we find people that don't know Jesus, and we bring them into this environment, our church, to where they can meet Jesus and get to know Him, where He can work in their hearts, a safe place, but not a comfortable one. This morning as I look at the reality of who we are, are we a great church? No, we're a good one, and we can become great. It was attributed to Joseph Kennedy, who was the father of President John Kennedy, this phrase, when the going gets tough, the tough get going. There's a lot of sayings that have been shared through life, uh, but uh, when I think about this, when I think about us, and I think about the Israelites, you know, God did not call the Israelites 
out of their slavery into a life of comfort, but he called them out of their slavery into a life that was tougher than that. And he waited until they were primed and ready for that journey. I want you to go back in Exodus and look at chapter 1 because I want to talk about what kind of people he's leading out of Egypt. In Exodus chapter 1, verses 11, and we're going to skip down to 13 and 14, it says, So they appointed taskmasters over them to afflict them with hard labor. Pharaoh was terrified of these people, by the way. And the Egyptians compelled the sons of Israel to labor vigorously. Or rigorously. And they made their lives bitter with hard labor in mortar and bricks and all kinds of labor in the field, all their labors which they rigorously imposed on them. I got to get this out of the way. A lot of times we think about the Israelites, we think about a bunch of whiners and complainers and weak people. These people were tough. They had held up under the, the rigors of slavery. They had been in a land where they had no say. These were tough people, but now it was time for God to say, it's time for the tough to get going. There's a journey. Now, many of you are familiar with this journey. You know how the people that came out of slavery, the ones that crossed the Red Sea out of slavery were not the people who crossed the Jordan into promise. You, you know about the complainings, the golden calf, the spies in the land, which we'll talk about this morning. We know about the shortcomings and the failings of these people. And this is left in Scripture for us as a cautionary tale to say God has got you as individuals, as Clear Creek Church. He has placed us on a journey toward destiny. And as we are on this journey toward destiny, we have to understand that it's not going to get easier, it's going to get tougher, but there's light at the end of the tunnel. And this morning, I want us to look at some parts of this journey, and I want to talk about the things that got in the way of the Israelites receiving their promise. First one I want to talk about this morning is comfort. Comfort. If you go to Exodus chapter 16, verse 3, I'm going to skip the middle part of that, and you'll see why in a minute. It says, would that he had died, uh, we had died by the Lord's hand in Egypt. By the way, they're, they're hungry. Uh, for you to have brought us, into this, uh, up, brought us out into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. We go to 17.3, and they complain about water. Why now have you brought us out from Egypt to kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst? Now, first, let's ask the obvious question. Is it wrong to complain because you're hungry and thirsty? Well, I can understand complaining about being hungry and thirsty. But that's not what's going on here. What they were saying is they were saying, we were in slavery. I'd rather be in slavery than on this journey. And here's the reason I would rather be in slavery than on this journey. Back to... 16.3. You see that in the middle? You brought us out here to die, but you see, in Egypt, we sat by the pots of meat, we ate bread to the full, and everything was so good. They were comfortable. It wasn't easy, but they were comfortable. And they had latched on to that comfort, and it had become their lifestyle. In a way, it had become their own God. And this comfort is what continued to get in the way of their joy in this journey. Imagine what they saw. Can you imagine seeing a sea part so wide that 1.5 million people were able to go through in, in very little time? Can you imagine seeing a pillar of fire at night and a cloud by day so that you wouldn't be roasted by the sun and manna to fall from the sky so you could eat and when you were tired of that, because after all, how many, times can, how many ways can you make manna, right? Birds flew so low to the ground that they had meat to eat. Water came from a rock. This is amazing, amazing stuff. And they had no joy in it. Because what they wanted more than anything else was to be comfortable. As Clear Creek on this journey, we're going to be asking you and ourselves to be uncomfortable. We can't hold on to our comfort and continue to achieve the mission that God has set before us. We cannot hold on to our comfort and continue to reach out for that one more. 
There's several things that are going to have to happen, guys. We, one of the things, and I, I'm going to be somewhat specific. Guys, we're going to have to scoot in tighter. We're going to have to make room for that new person. You know, we'll sit three, four hours at a ball game, shoulder to shoulder and hip to hip, but we seem to want to come to church and spread out like dinner on the grounds. If you see somebody you don't know and they're looking for a chair, if there's one, not one next to them, give them yours. We have got to be accommodating because God continues to send people our way. And it is our responsibility as the Lord's church here to reach out to those people. And I will guarantee you if someone comes and they can't find a seat, they're not going to come back. And if your comfort is more important than their soul, please let me know. Because I'd like to tell you that it's not. We, we have a new parking system out front, and I want to tell you something about this parking system. You may not know this about me, but uh, I, I like to, to study and pray. I'm here real early on Sundays, and I'm, I'm looking out. My window looks out on the parking lot, and I watch you guys come in. Isn't that creepy? And, and I watch y'all come in, and I want to tell you something I saw this parking thing was all done while I was on sabbatical. I came back and I saw the signs and it says uh, to our guest, to the elderly, or, or to the seniors, I think is what it says, to the handicapped and to uh, expectant moms. And this is especially for expectant moms who are handicapped, elderly, and, and, and all that. Um, th there's a special area right in front. And, and I watched an elderly woman in this church. I won't name her name uh, because it, it would embarrass her. But I watched her come in and park. And she did, she did take advantage of the seniors area, but she parked as far away from the front door as she possibly could. And I'm telling you, this person's really elder. I mean, I don't know how she old, old she is, and I know she wouldn't tell me. We'd probably have to cut her in half and count the rings. <laughs> but she parked so far away, as far away as she possibly could, and still in that parking lot. And she walked into the building. I watched her walk. It took her probably four times as long as it would someone younger and healthier. But you know, Jesus walked 60 miles to be baptized. And I am so, so honored to worship with someone who will walk an extra 60 yards so someone else might. See, that's what we're asking you to do. For our guests... For our elderly, and we, we want to put them up front because, once again, if you can't find a place to park, it's hard to come back the next week. But we're asking you to walk 60 extra yards so that someone might come in contact with Jesus Christ. Give up your comfort. And guys, there is no excuse with as many talented people as we have in this congregation for us to have to beg for volunteers. We should have to turn you away. Give up your comfort. The mission is bigger than any one of us. It is time for us to say, no longer is this about me. This is about God, and it is about His mission, and this is about finding people that don't know Jesus and bringing them into a life-changing relationship with Him. And Jesus knew it. Luke chapter 9 he, wrote, he said these words that just kind of ring in my ears. It says, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself. Forget your comfort. Deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life for my sake, he is the one who will save it. For what is a man profited if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits himself? What we need to carry on this journey. Because if we don't, it's going to stop. We need to be people who say, I no longer need my comfort. I am willing to be uncomfortable for the furtherance of God's kingdom. Because in the journey of the Israelites, it was their comfort that kept them from feeling this joy. It's time to lose ourselves again. Number two, impatient and, impatience and distraction. 
Uh, on this journey, the Israelites are journeying on. They've already complained about water. God is taking care of their complaints. They've already complained about food. God is taking care of their complaints. But now they get to this huge mountain called Sinai. And we're familiar with what happens on Mount Sinai. We know that Moses goes up to the mountain and he speaks to God, this burning bush. And, and he receives these Ten Commandments that are written in stone. But what happens while Moses is up, up on the mountain is not germane to what we want to talk about this morning. I want to tell you something about how Satan works. You know, on this journey, you don't hear much about Satan, but Satan is obviously working in the minds and the hearts of these people. And what happens while Moses is on the mountain, Satan uses their impatience to distract them. If we, we turn to the book of Exodus, chapter 32, and I want to first start at, look at verse 1. It says, Now when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mountain, uh, the people assembled about Aaron, his brother, and said to him, Come, make us a God who will go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. Now, let's stop for just a minute. They're about to make a golden calf. Y'all know that, right? Y'all figured that one out? But you know why they did it? Moses just gone too long. Is that not the stupidest reason you've ever heard in, the, in, in your life? But isn't that the way we operate? We're on this journey, we're, we're a part of this big thing, and it's just not happening as fast as we'd like for it to happen. And so we get impatient. We say, you know, the people I'm discipling are not growing as fast as I'd like for them to grow, and, and so we become impatient. Or I'm teaching this class, and this class is not responding the way I'd like for them to respond. Or, or I'm in this small group, and this small group's not working the way I want it to work. And we get impatient, and what happens is we lose sight of the big picture. The big picture is we connect people with God and with each other. And so we try all kinds of different things. We take our eyes off the prize. We take our eyes off the mission, and we start doing small things that continue to interfere with the journey. And then we go to Satan's greatest tool, distraction, in verse 4. And we read this. He took from their hand. Uh, he took this from their hand. By the way, it was the gold from all the women, sons, and daughters. Uh, you'll find in there, by the way, that the sons were wearing earrings, which I think is interesting. And he fashioned it with a graving tool and made it into a molten calf. And they said, this is your God, O Israel, who brought you up from the land of Egypt. What happens when we become faithless in this journey? What happens when we become distracted is we start trying to create God in our image rather than recognizing we're created in His. And that's what's happening here. They're, they're, they're fashioning this golden calf because they need something that they can see. And the truth is they need something they can blame. And that's what happens when we get distracted on this journey. We make gods out of things that were never intended to be gods. We make gods out of our classes. We make gods out of our ministries. We make gods out of our jobs. We make gods out of our play. I read this week, someone said uh, this, he said, that, that we worship our work, we work at our play, and we play at our worship. And you know that's true. And we get so distracted by the things going on around us, we lose sight that we are on a journey to destiny. As individuals and as a church, we are on a journey to destiny. And we need to stop making gods out of the things around us and realize that there is only one God that's living. Satan's a schemer. And he will work against us. You know, in the book of Ephesians chapter 6, uh, the apostle Paul is writing to this church and he's telling them, Put on the full armor of God so that you'll be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. Church, we're on a journey. We're on a journey from slavery into destiny, and we're not there yet. Are we a good church? We're a good church. Are we a great church? We're not there yet, but we can be. 
We've got to watch out for those schemes, for that trickery, for that deception, for those distractions, for the impatience that seems to well up within us because those are the things that left the Israelites in the middle of the journey never to finish. And the last thing I want to talk about this morning is fear. There's a phrase in Scripture that is used almost more than any phrase in all of Scripture. It's the, the phrase, fear not. We're told repeatedly uh, from, from Genesis to Revelation, fear not. Don't be afraid. Be courageous. The problem is sometimes we get so distracted that we live in fear. We worry about what the world's going to think. We, sometimes we can lead from a sense of fear. It's like, you know, what if we make this move and it's the wrong thing and we become part of this paralysis by analysis? We've got to stop living in fear and start living in boldness. In the book of Numbers, in chapter 13, Spies have been sent in the land to, to see this promised land. Twelve of them went in. It was a land growing with milk and honey. And they went in, and every, man, it was everything God said it was. Grapes as big as your head. And, and they come out, and they, they're trying to decide whether or not they're going to give a good report to the people. Joshua and Caleb say, we should surely go into the land. Because, once again, God sent them in there to see the land that he would give them, not that he might give them. But the spies said this. We're not able to go up against the people, for they are too strong for us. The land through which we have gone and spying it out, it is a land that devours its inhabitants. And the people whom we saw in there, men of great size. They also saw the Nephilim, the sons of Anak, or part of the Nephilim. Goliath, by the way, was part of the Nephilim. And we became like grasshoppers in our own sight and so we were in their sight. When I was a kid, I've told this story before. Some of you may remember it. When I was a, a kid living in Mount Juliet, we had neighbors that lived behind us. Their name were the Hagens. They had two big Newfoundland dogs, which are like St. Bernard's on steroids. And, and I can remember they grew grapes at the back of their property. And, and, and the place where we played basketball in the community, we'd have to walk by their fence and one day Mr. and Ms. Hagen were out at the fence and um, we, we stopped by to talk with them for just a minute and Mrs. Hagen was German and she had a strong German accent and we were looking at their grapes and I remember saying to Mr. Hagen uh, you got to watch out those grasshoppers are oh, there's grasshoppers the grasshoppers are all all over your grapes and Mrs. Hagen turned around in that strong thick German accent and she said oh joy Grasshoppers don't eat grapes. And she's right. Grasshoppers are, are built for fleeing, not for fighting. That's why their back legs are so big. And if you ever watch a grasshopper on a grape, they may land on it, but they're not equipped to enjoy the goodness of the grape. In this land, these men were like grasshoppers in their own sight. And when they were grasshoppers in their own sight, they were grasshoppers in the sight of the other people too. And I see the church sometimes just like a grasshopper on a grape. Oh, we want to dig into the goodness. We want to dig into the sweetness. We know there's something there that is better than anything that we've ever experienced before, but we just can't get our hands around it because we have become so used to fleeing instead of fighting. We've been so used to living in fear fear of failure and fear of what other people may think, that we just can't seem to grasp what God has promised for us. We stand, church, we stand right now in a place that is approaching the Jordan. We stand right now this far from our destiny. We stand right now on the, the, the edge of being a great church. <clears throat> but we cannot allow our comfort and our impatience 
and distraction and fear to take hold of us. Because if we do, we'll never reach our destiny. We won't reach our destiny as individuals and we'll never reach our destiny as a church. And the next year, there's, you're going to be called to discomfort. You're going to be called to think outside the box. You're going to be called to be strong and courageous. You're going to be called to be people who are of power and love and discipline and do not have a spirit of fear. You're going to be called to change. You're going to be called to growing pains. And we're still on this journey. Here's what I want. I don't mind being selfish for just a minute here. Guys, I want to cross the Jordan with you. That's what I want. I want us to band together. I want us to lock arms. I want us to keep our minds on what the prize really is and stop worrying about the piddly things around us. I want us to lock arms and to cross the Jordan together. I want to see Clear Creek become a church of destiny. But the only way that we're going to be able to do that is to admit that we're not right now and that there's things about us that we're going to have to change. There's parts in us that are going to have to grow. And there are areas of our lives that are going to have to be uncomfortable. Let's pray together. God, you're an amazing God. And we thank you. I thank you for this story. Uh, it's encouraged me. I don't know what it's done for anybody else, but it's meant a lot to me. Don't let my own comfort and need for comfort get in the way. Don't let me be distracted or impatient. And as I work as a leader in this church, don't let me lead from a position of fear, but of boldness. Here's what I know. You're an amazing God, and we thank you. And it's in your son's name we pray. Amen. You know, we will not get to that promised land alone. Uh, in, in Exodus chapter 33, verses 15 and 16, you know, God had gone to Moses and basically said he wanted to destroy all the Israelites because of uh, uh, their sin uh, with the golden calf. And Moses said these words, Phil, if you can put them up on the board. In, in Exodus chapter 33, 15 and 16. As Moses speaks to God, he says, If your presence does not go with us, do not lead us up from here. It's not, is it not by your going with us so that we, I and your people, may be distinguished from all the other people who are upon the face of the earth? The way we reach that promised land is if we hold on to the hand of God. It's not going to be by our effort and will. It, we, we may put ourselves in a position for God to bless us, but it's God blessing us that has gotten us this far and will get us into the future. But I also believe that we have to take that first step. We believe that your journey, your individual journey with Jesus begins at baptism. And we want to invite you to be baptized in the Christ, raised to walk in newness of life. We know that some of you are on your own personal journey and you need the encouragement and prayers of others. That's nothing to be ashamed of. Everybody gets there at some point. If you would like the prayers of the church, we'd love to pray with you. Some of you may need shepherding. Our elders will be in rooms A5 and 7 across the hall out these doors. They'd love to sit down with you individually and help you heal what's broken in your life, or at least start that process. Guys, we're on a journey to destiny. If you're not on it with us, will you join us?